We now have a guest with us today, David Pavan, who's the Deputy Registrar of the College of Pharmacists. Welcome, David. Great to have you on board. Thank you, Derek. Glad to be here. So uh, before we get into specific topics, I think it might be useful to reiterate from your perspective for the pharmacists that are watching the episode today and, and, uh, and maybe even members of the public, what the role of the college is. Okay, sure. Um, in, in simple terms, uh, the college's role is to protect the public. Um, and we do that uh, by licensing pharmacies and pharmacists and pharmacy technicians. So we basically regulate the profession of pharmacy. And uh, the profession of pharmacy uh, is um, governed by a couple of acts, uh, the Health Professions Act and the Pharmacy Operations and Drug Scheduling Act. And those base uh, form the basis of the guidelines uh, for us to regulate the profession. So uh, one of the criticisms I think that we've heard in the past from some members of the profession is that, um, you know, the college isn't there when they need them, that they don't feel like they get support from the college. And, and maybe that's an unrealistic expectation. Maybe that that's, you know, I think from what you just said, it's really not the job of the college to be there and sort of have the pharmacist back. Maybe that's really more the job of an advocacy body like the BC Pharmacy Association. Yeah, and that, that's an accurate statement. Um, I still think there's a lot of confusion out there on the roles of the different organizations. Um, as I mentioned, the college is a regulatory body, and so we regulate the profession on behalf of the public. Um, the advocacy bodies, whether it be the BC Pharmacy Association, uh, you know, the, the Pharmacy Technician Association or the Hospital Pharmacy Association, uh, th those bodies advocate on behalf of, of their members. And so there's a difference between a membership and a registrant. Uh, membership is usually yeah. a voluntary thing. You don't have to be a member of, of those associations. It's a voluntary thing. Uh, with the college, in order to practice, you have to be a registrant. You don't have a choice. So I still think there is a lot of confusion out there on, on the different roles that, that those organizations play. And, uh, you know, we have similarities in that we have boards of directors. Um, you know, ours, uh, as yours, uh, for the associations, are elected members. Um, but in, in, in the um, college's case, uh, they also have government appointees. Um, and even though we have elected members, they're not there to represent their constituents. Uh, they're there to uh, represent the public and uh, act in the best interest of the public. So they're, they're agnostic as, as with regards to where they came from. So let's go to that issue of the public or the government appointees to the board. Um, you know, I think that the perception of some members of the profession is that that's a negative thing from, from their perspective. You know, from your perspective in terms of protecting the public, do you see value in the public appointees that are on the college board? I certainly do. Um, the board's made up of 12 members, uh, eight elected uh, and four appointed. Uh, the elected members are consistent of uh, pharmacy, uh, a pharmacy technician, two hospital pharmacists, and uh, five community practicing pharmacists. Um, you know, there, there is a movement towards a more balanced board representation where uh, some colleges have gone to 50% public members and 50% elected members or registrants. Um, I feel that the public members are very valuable. Uh, they bring in that perspective uh, of the public lens. Um, all of them at some point have probably uh, used a pharmacy as a member of the public. Right. Um, so that issue of a 50-50 thing, does that, you, how does the College of Pharmacists feel about that if in fact government were to move in that direction from the perspective of feeling like maybe, and I think members might feel like, or registrants, that that the profession's losing control if, in fact, you get to that point where 50% of a board is not from the profession. So when you say control, what are you referring to? Control of what? Well, I guess that's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm reiterating what I'm hearing from pharmacists sometimes yeah. is, is, you know, that we should control that. I guess the flip side of that, unfortunately, is that I also hear from a lot of pharmacists pharmacists who refer to the college as as them in other words they don't see themselves as as part of the college and you know as a registrant or as a in air quotes here I'm going to use the word member but as a yeah. registrant and yeah. to them the college is the enemy it, that's from a lot of pharmacists perspectives well that, that's unfortunate <laughs> uh, 
Um, that's not the perspective I, I've seen, um, but you know, it is what it is. Um, I think, you know, registrants should probably look at the college as a resource. Um, you know, we're, we're there to protect the public, but we're also there to help pharmacists understand uh, their role. Um, you know, we have a number of, of, of different um, programs. For example, our practice review program, uh, where we visit pharmacists and pharmacies and pharmacy technicians. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that program is entirely educational. It is not punitive. Uh, it's there to help uh, our, our registrants practice uh, uh, to their maximum. And, um, you know, we have other, other programs that we run. We have the, the pharmacy manager training program. Uh, that was put in place a, a number of years ago because we kept seeing an increase in the number of pharmacy managers who didn't fully understand their roles and responsibilities. Right. Uh, so that program is, is, has been brought in to help them better understand what their role is and, and how to manage a pharmacy and hopefully improve uh, patient safety and, and patient outcomes and patient care. Um, so, you know, I, I think the role of the college in protecting the public uh, is is their role as far as, as how the, the, the registrants would view it. We're, right. we're not there to advocate on their behalf. We're not there to support them. We're there to protect the public. So let me shift gears a little bit. Um, I know, and I think this is uh, um, something that maybe a lot of registrants don't really know is potentially in the works. And that's the whole issue with uh, the government potentially moving to do some consolidation around um, health profession regulation and in particular with some of the smaller uh, health professions that don't have a lot of registrants. Um, what's the College of Pharmacists position on that? Because it's my understanding that it's one of the bigger colleges um, and it might be at some point in time that the College of Pharmacists is actually regulating other healthcare professionals as well. Is that is that the case? Yeah, so I think you're referring to the Harry Caton report. Yes. And, and uh, Harry Caton did uh, uh, a deep dive into the College of uh, Dental Surgeons. Right. Um, and, and in addition to that, he, he did uh, um, a review of, of the HPA. Um, and uh, as, as far as, as consolidation, I, I think when you look at some of the smaller colleges and, um, and, and the resources they have uh, to, to govern, and, and protect the public by, by regulating their professionals um, or registrants, they don't have the resources to do that. And, and for example, right. um, you know, one discipline case can cost you know, eighty to $100,000 uh, and could bankrupt uh, some of the smaller colleges. So I think from a government perspective, they feel that they don't have the resources to properly regulate their profession. So there is a movement towards consolidation, um, or, or at least that's the, the message that's being sent from uh, the, current, the current government. Um, with regards to the, uh, the College of Pharmacists, we're quite unique in that we not only have the Health Professions Act that governs us, we also have the Pharmacy Operations and Drug Scheduling Act. So it, it would be very difficult, I think, for, for our college to amalgamate uh, with some of the other um, regulatory bodies okay, that are out there. Um, you know, there's, there's talk about, you know, putting regulatory colleges based on, on different parameters, for example, body parts, you know, so all the eye people go together, all the, the mouth people oh, go right. together, right? Okay. Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, every, anybody who touches somebody goes together. So there's different, you know, there's different, um, really? approaches to, to yeah. how that will happen. Um, I don't think it's been, you know, put forward on how it's going to happen. It's not imminent, um, obviously. And, and, you know, it's a work in progress. You know, the, the government has has put a task force together, and I think it's the, the health minister uh, and the health critics from, from each of the two uh, elected parties, the Green Party and, and the Liberal Party. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. I think their recommendations are coming out sometime in early next year. So thank you for that, because that really provides a lot of clarity for me and probably for a lot of our listeners as well, because there was a lot of information there that I didn't know, <laughs> including that a discipline case could cost 80 or 100 grand. So the lawyers are still making money. No question. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I totally get and, and, and I, I think, you know, that provides a little clarity for, I think, registrants of, of the College of Pharmacists as to what, what kind of uh, resources and support and costs does the college have to incur on an ongoing basis that they have to charge 
the kinds of registration fees that are charged on an annual basis, both from pharmacies and pharmacists. And you know, I think a lot of pharmacists probably wonder where does my money go and what you know what is it spent on. And if you have to deal with a few discipline cases a year at those kind of rates, it doesn't take long to eat through some good coin. Yeah, it's uh, it's an expensive process, and and you know, um, even with some of the inquiry cases, you know. Uh, Registrants are, are, are seeking legal advice much earlier in the process, and, and that always costs more on both sides. Yeah. Um, but that's just one of, the, one of the areas where the college spends uh, resources. You know, we have um, our new ownership requirements uh, that came into effect, yeah. um, and, and that's been very uh, labor-intensive from, from the college's side on our license and registration department. Um, our practice review program, which I mentioned earlier, um, again, you know, not not a cheap program to run, but we feel very beneficial uh, for public protection. Well, that's great. Um, so maybe before we wrap up this segment, we can just kind of visit uh, a couple of other little things briefly, because um, I think this has been really useful for people to have a little bit better of an understanding of what the college does and, and why it, it's there to regulate the profession and protect the public from, I'm going to say, bad pharmacy practice. Um, I, can you just comment on um, a, a piece of criticism that I know I've heard a few times from pharmacists who say that when bad practice, um, or and maybe it's it's not necessarily the practice of pharmacy, but when pharmacists are doing things that seem to be offside to other pharmacists and they raise complaints with the college, they sometimes feel that the college is very slow to act or doesn't take action. And a lot of this clearly has been around in the past, um, methadone pharmacies and, and pharmacies that you know, tried to sort of specialize in, in that area. Um, how do you react to that kind of criticism? Um, so, you know, I, I believe in our last fiscal year, we had 794 uh, complaints that came through to our college and uh, we investigated through the HPA and direction of, of the inquiry committee somewhere in, uh, in the range of 128 of those. Um, so, you know, it's it's an ongoing process. I think some of the disconnect probably uh, comes from the fact of the lack of understanding on how that process works. Um, so when, when, when a complaint is brought before the college, uh, it, it is it is you know handled in, in a way that, that maybe isn't well understood. Um, so when a complaint comes in, uh, an investigator will be so assigned to that complaint and they will do some information gathering. Uh, once they've gathered that information, they will present that information to uh, an inquiry committee panel. And that panel will, will give either one of two outcomes. They will either give direction to investigate or no further action. And so once direction uh, to investigate has been given, uh, it, uh, it starts a clock of 120 days. And so the investigator has 120 days to complete that investigation. Um, that, that investigation may include a site visit, it may include pulling Pharmanet records, uh, may include in, in, uh, you know, interviewing registrants, uh, other, uh, other people that may be involved, staff members or, or other registrants that were there, yeah. uh, a physician, a nurse practitioner, right. uh, whoever else might have been involved. Once all that information is gathered, uh, a report is written and it's brought back to the inquiry committee. Uh, for, for their decision. And that whole process is what we call a consent process, okay? And uh, the inquiry committee has to, has to um, uh, come to an agreement with the registrant, a consent agreement on the outcome. And, and that outcome may be no further action. It may be a letter of uh, advice, uh, maybe a letter of reprimand. It may be a fine, it may be a suspension. Um, you know, maybe limits and conditions on the practice, right. okay. uh, but it's all a consent agreement. And, and those agreements aren't made public unless they're deemed of a serious nature. So although it may seem that the college isn't doing much, it's because the way the Health Professions Act is written, these consent agreements aren't made public. So there's a lot of stuff behind so, the scenes so that a lot people of, have no awareness of. Exactly. Okay. Um, now, if you can't come to a consent agreement with that registrant, then it, it falls down to the discipline channel. <clears throat> okay. and, and, and that, again, is, is a different process. The, the discipline process is very public. It is like a, a, uh, a court of law. Um, the college will have a lawyer that presents the evidence gathered by the investigator. Um, <clears throat> the discipline panel will have a lawyer to advise them. And the registrant usually has a lawyer and it's public 
Everything that happens right. is made public. And so it's a very different process than the consent agreement process. So the committee does. of those complaints, uh, I think the number you used was 794, maybe in the last fiscal year. Can you just give us a sense of uh, what percentage of those complaints are from the public versus from within the profession, like from one pharmacist about another? Yeah, I, I can't give you exact ballpark. Numbers. Is it vast? Is it more from the public though? Generally, our complaints are mostly from um, public members that that have had you know a negative experience at a pharmacy. Okay. Um, you know, seven hundred ninety three seems like a large number. Uh, a lot of those complaints are a misunderstanding that can often be resolved without having to go through the inquiry process. Yeah. Um, but the ones that aren't obviously go through that process. My experience has been oftentimes that a lot of those things are just because, not because the pharmacist necessarily did something wrong, but the, the complaint arises because of how they handle the situation more so than what the situation actually was. And, and that's an accurate statement. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Well, thanks very much for taking the time to be with us today, and we look forward to having you back. Um, so uh, that wraps up Pharmacy in Flux, and uh, we look forward to having David again as another guest on a future episode. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.